thank you very much uh, for coming and thank you, as James said, to the Farmers Club for hosting this. There was a, a venue change um, and it feels a little bit of an upgrade in a way because there's a dress code in this venue, um, which, is, uh, which is a first for the lectures that I've given on these subjects, so that's a rather, rather nice thing. Uh, on the subject of dress codes, while I was digging out my suit yesterday, I found there was a jacket in my wardrobe that had been completely eaten by moths. <laughs> and last night, I was up awake in bed at about 3 a.m., obsessing about the fact that I'd lost this jacket. I tried cutting the buttons off, which I always do. I've got heaps of these things, but it's just sort of scrimp and save. Um, and one of them was sort of pinged off down the carpet, and I hadn't found it. And then I suddenly became self-aware. I'm lying in bed at 3 a.m. on the day before an important lecture, obsessing about a jacket that I've worn hundreds of times. What, what is going on? Because in the lecture today, I'm talking about, I think there are two buildings that no longer exist that are very important to this nation's story and to the story of humanity and philosophy. Three of the buildings are in a state of utter ruination, consolidated ruination in in a couple of cases, but nevertheless, they're wrecked. And then I'm worrying about a jacket. So it's very, very interesting that part of human psychology is if something is closer to you and it's more graspable, it's smaller, then that's something that can get you further ahead. You're more engaged, perhaps emotionally or intellectually, about what that means. So this jacket that I like that had disintegrated yesterday gives me the perfect MacGuffin, as they say in the film industry, sort of vehicle, an object that really isn't important in itself, but it takes us somewhere else because it takes us into this conversation that's suddenly very abstract, this conversation about profound loss and grief over cultural loss, something that's destroyed your regret that it's no longer something that you can, in one case, wear, in another case, go and visit, see it work, and for it to be part of our culture. So the lecture as a whole really is about a kind of a MacGuffin. It's sort of an object that in itself isn't particularly important, but it takes us on a journey that we need to go on. It progresses that narrative, and that thing is the garnet crystal, uh, which you can see revolving just there. So I use the word emblem, and I've also used the word philosophical, which of course means that I could do a five-hour lecture about what is and isn't a symbol, and I don't want to do that. I want to get stuck into the real meat of this. So I think actually MacGuffin is the word that we're going to run with, just because people in cinema are a bit more down to earth and we can, we can sort of run with this idea. So where I come from, uh, James explained in the introduction, my academic background, but I have a company, Birger Genicht, and the motto of this consultancy is the preservation of meaning is the only meaningful preservation, which is a little bit of a jingle, and it sort of catches me out because I've just been talking about being upset at 3 a.m. about an object. Clearly, I'm not entirely anti-materialist. But there is this sense that there is something beyond the material, that there are, in the conceptual worlds things that are to do with what endures through change. So in philosophy, in, in Greek philosophy, we might think about what is the good. In theology, what is God? So godness, goodness. So talking about God as an emblem of goodness, we could say an emblem of godness, and this is really what's going to propel us forward. Now, before I get stuck into the history from Henry III, I really want to give some background to set us up with these conceptual frameworks and hopefully not take too long about it, but this is, this is quite fundamentally important. So Plato, uh, absolutely extraordinary uh, philosopher and really the founder of a lot of Western thought, said some peculiar things in the corners of his works. And the work that I'm particularly thinking of is the Timaeus and Critias. Um, we just tend to call it Timaeus, but this is a dialogue where there are two main speakers, so it's named after those speakers. One is Timaeus, the other one is Critias. Plato puts his words into these people. And in the first part of it, the part with Timaeus, he talks about the four elements, and he says that these are atoms, because the Greeks, Democritus, had this idea of the indivisible particle. So he said each one must be different for the four elements. So you have fire, earth, air, and water. Luckily, I have some water. 
Fire is the tetrahedron. It's spiky, fire pyramid, it's somehow intuitive, the shape of a flame. Earth, these blocks that can fit together. Air is an octahedron. So this is like two Egyptian pyramids, one sort of glued to the bottom of another, and that, that will be important. And water is the icosahedron. Each one of these, and I won't read it out because it'll take the whole lecture, he devotes a couple of pages to, a real wodge of text for each one. What is its geometry? How does it fit together? Why is it perfect? Well, we call these the platonic solids after this tract because their edges, their corners, their sides, everything is completely identical. But then he said, ah, there remained yet a fifth construction which God used for embroidering constellations on the whole heaven. And he doesn't say what it is. Complete blank. So for quite a long time, people have been publishing in books really the most conservative estimate of what this thing could be. And they've said, well, OK, these are the, the first four platonic solids defined in Euclid's 13th book. So the fifth one, obviously, must be the pentagonal dodecahedron. That's the fifth three-dimensional platonic solid. Well, there's no evidence that Plato himself actually knew about that particular shape, and all of the masses of writing about these ones have a certain geometry to them, which is all about triangles and all about squares. So, we introduce the rhombic dodecahedron, because the Pythagoreans are known to have been interested in dodecahedra, but we only have the word, and that word also applies to this shape, and this shape does occur in nature. It occurs in nature as one of these, this rock in my hands is older than our species, this came out of the ground like this. The form of the garnet crystal as a rhombic dodecahedron is imposed by nature, by the atomic structure of this thing. So you imagine walking up a mountain in uh, Bohemia or um, Sri Lanka um, and just picking one of these up. It's like a glitch in the world where you find this perfect shape this is a large example I use for teaching, so it's got a lot of inclusions, it's very dark. The garnet crystal, when it's in a pure gem form, is glossy red. There are sometimes other colours, but it's really a very, very impressive mineral. So you can understand how this might be of interest to Plato, and how does that then delve deeper? Where does it go from there? Well, there are two things about this that are very important. The first one is it can fill three-dimensional space. So remember I said that this book, Timaeus Critias, has got two parts to it, one speaker and another speaker. Well, the second speaker is talking about a perfect society. How do those two things merge? The idea of perfect mathematics, geometry, the ideal form of things, and a perfect society, how do they come together? Well, roll on centuries in Freemasonry, you have the idea of cubes, like the ones here being the ideal form of a person, it's an allegory. So you can fit cubes together with no gaps, they fit into a perfect society. Well, you can fit these together as well with no gaps, but you have to maybe jostle them about to fit. There's a hexagonal projection, there's a square projection, so you can see it's a bit more subtle than just cubes. So perhaps this is leading us towards that. And then the second important thing is the way that this shape is a three-dimensional projection of a four-dimensional platonic solid. Somebody coming along and saying, well, this can't be Plato's perfect fifth element because it isn't technically a platonic solid. You can see that it's uh, longer that way and shorter that way on its sides. They're rhombuses, they aren't squares, they aren't triangles. Well, actually, this is like the ghost, the shadow, the emanation, the outpouring of a perfect shape in a higher spatial dimension. So if you want something, going back to the jacket, if you want a MacGuffin, <laughs> if you want something that in itself isn't that important, <coughs> isn't a platonic solid, but it's going to take you there, it's going to take you higher up in your meditation in the subject, this is the one that you go for, it will take you on that journey. Because the majority of the period that I'm going to talk about is <coughs> Uh, well, in fact, the entirety of uh, th this period, um, we're talking about um, everybody being heavily involved who are in philosophy with Christianity. Towards the end of the 18th century, of course, you get all sorts of 
you know, different philosophical traditions coming about and scepticism, we have to address the biblical aspect of how these things are talked about and received through our period. Now, the place that everyone goes to is Ezekiel, the vision. And it's really interesting, and I don't want to put too much into this, but I find it interesting that part of Ezekiel is talking about visions where he's talking about the throne of God being a sapphire crystal. And this is a sapphire crystal. Again, not, not a very uh, gem quality one, because otherwise we wouldn't be able to afford to have such a large one. But you can see it naturally grows as a hexagonal column. And so Ezekiel's saying, this is the throne of God. And then he says, he'll make my forehead like flint. Everything was the colour of amber. What's going on? Colour of beryl. He's talking about stones. This brings in this geometry to the vision of Ezekiel. God doesn't need bling. Why is he talking about sapphires? Does he literally mean that God sits on a sapphire stone he needs? I don't think that's really what he's driving at. And in his description of the wondrous beings of heaven, he talks about wheels within wheels. And we have a video that we published on YouTube explaining in great depth, and I'm not going to subject you to the entire exposition on that, of how these wheels within wheels with the eyelets, the eyes around them, and the way they gather coals from within. The word coal, ember, is used in the classical world. It's carbuncle, it's a garnet crystal. So the idea that you could project this through and that Ezekiel trying to persuade people to conform in religion, which is what this book is all about, and then collecting them as embers might be to do with an allegory to do with this, this conception of them fitting together into a perfect society. So on one level, this is arch MacGuffinry. On one level, this is talking about, well, actually, the role of the prophet is bringing people into this conformity. They can work together. Maybe they'll be able to save the country. It's very prosaic. Obviously, everything Ezekiel was writing about was much more of a... Um, of a theophany, he was meeting God. There's a lot more to this on that anagogic level, on that mystical level, that frankly can't quite be expressed through words. But there is a level of reading this, an allegorical level, a step below that, that level that begins you on that journey of meditating on these subjects that does seem to involve these ideas. That was certainly taken as being true by the Anglo-Saxons. And one of the things that I'm involved in is the Thanes of Mercy Living History Group. And we do a lot of research and public presentation trying to bring some very unfamiliar history to life. And I'll be doing a series of lectures at Sutton Hoo over the bank holiday uh, later in August. And we published some papers about this so they're free to access ourselves because we felt this needed to be out in the world. Um, and in short, you find that the majority of regalia in the early Anglo-Saxon period is based around garnets. They had sapphires, they had rubies, they even had diamonds. They had everything, and yet they chose to import directly, spectral analysis has shown, import directly garnets, both from Bohemia, present-day Chechia, and from the southern tip of India and Sri Lanka, in order to get slightly different colours to make their designs work. They were ordered to spec. They went to the ends of the known world to find this stone above any other in the Anglo-Saxon work. And all of their geometry was put into their jewellery in this form. There's even, from near Malden, a holy water sprinkler in a rhombic dodecahedron form. Their church towers were built with something called a Rhenish helm, which is half a rhombic dodecahedron. So all of that I've covered in other lectures and will continue to cover, and you can find these papers uh, to look up, but I want to speed forward to Henry III um, because really things begin to accelerate and that's the main focus. So let's begin, finally, <laughs> with the 13th century. This is the Cosmati pavement in Westminster Abbey. This may be familiar to you from the recent coronation of His Majesty the King. The coronation happens there. That's where the anointing happens. That's where the crown is placed, where the big red arrow is pointing. It's absolutely extraordinary. 
it has an inscription in it. It's the only pavement of this kind that has an inscription in it. That inscription says that this represents the whole universe, the cosmos, from creation all the way through to judgment day. The entire thing is represented here. So remember when I said about that fourth dimension, stepping outside of time. A lot of theology is about the idea of, well, where is God? God can't be bound by time, surely. Maybe there's this relationship there where the nature of God, or wherever God is, is something that can look in on time all in one go. This is what this pavement aims to do. It's a two-dimensional representation of a, some higher dimensional land of God. And what are all of these little stones? Well, people become beguiled by it simply because there's a huge depth of meaning. Going back to the jacket, the, Mugu you know, the MacGuffin idea. Um, what's it doing? What are we latching on to? Well, a lot of people latch on to this material, which is imperial porphyry. And I spent probably my whole pension buying this. Um, this is exceedingly rare. This stone was quarried only from one mountain in the Red Sea mountains of Egypt by the pharaohs, quarried out. They built monuments in ancient Egypt from this material, statues of pharaohs, things like that. The stones were then taken by the Roman emperors and used for the most senior temples and imperial objects, sarcophaguses of great emperors, columns of the inner sanctums of temples. And then it's used for the imperial birthing chamber in Constantinople during the Byzantine period. If you were born in the purple, it didn't just mean you wore the purple robes of an emperor, it meant you were born in the room where this was. This actually conferred legitimacy on those medieval Greek monarchs. In an English context, the purple imperial porphyry that was used in the Cosmati pavement in Westminster Abbey around the shrine of Edward the Confessor because Henry III had a great Anglo-Saxon revival because the barons weren't on his side, he was being invaded. The, the people were the people he could reach to, and the church. So between them, they sort of cooked up this Anglo-Saxon revival. A lot of people visiting this pavement, they look at this and they say, the pavement is all about Imperium, it's all about reaching back to Rome. But actually, that isn't entirely the case. Sort of led astray a bit by the richness of these materials that were gifted by the Pope. That is part of the story, it's not the whole story, because of course it's not just porphyry. You've got all these other stones in there too, and even glass. And they're all different shapes, sizes, materials. And think back to what it's actually telling us in the inscription. It's the whole cosmos through time. So each one of these stones actually represents a human soul. And they're all different. It's a huge amount of diversity. They're all different sizes, shapes, colours. So you have some that are imperial porphyry. And you have some that are perfect marble or white marble or cheap glass. It's a whole mixture. But the whole of it is part of God's plan. And what's more than that, these roundels around the outside in particular, they're all unique. But you can detect within them, this one here, that one up there, Islamicate designs. They're representing different social contracts. They're representing different civilizations, both through time and through space. It's the world's biggest pride flag. <laughs> It is, it is diversity. It's saying this is all part of God's plan. And what is it intending to do? What is the lesson to be learnt here? Where is this taking us in the narrative? Well, the king sits there when he's crowned, and that's an extraordinary power exchange relationship where the entire country gives absolute power to an absolute monarch, power of life and death, power over everything, frightening level of power. So the person who sits there is potentially an unknown quantity. They've just ascended to the throne by salient law, semi-salient law. It's, it's inherited. Here they are. Who are they? How are they going to act? This person looks down and they see this pavement that you couldn't possibly memorise or understand. It's so complicated. And then they point out, ah, well, you see, in our time and place, this, this, bit's, this bit's England in 1280. 1300, 1307, say the accession of Edward II, 1307, imagine you're sitting there and say, oh, well, you know, 1307, you see, that was back here, that was your grandfather, you're, you're, you're just here. And there are three stones. 
said, well, I know more people than three. There are more souls around me than three. So you can see how crude the pavement is compared to reality, the actual cosmos. It's just something that gets us further along that meditation. And so it's there for humility. The monarch is supposed to look at it and go, ah, so I'm supposed to be God's representative in the sense that I'm an anointed king and I have this temporal power. I can execute people. I can go to war. I can do this. I can do that. I know diddly squat because this pavement is telling me just the scale of how little I understand. And that might help move somebody towards being a better ruler. In Plato's words, he would say, that makes me into a guardian. A lot of Plato's philosophy based around his trauma with his tutor, Socrates, being put to death for asking too many questions, asking the wrong questions, questioning the mystery cults, all of these sort of things, put to death essentially for sacrilege. And Plato didn't like that very much, and so he sort of thought, well, no, we need to be ruled by philosophers. So this is a, this is a MacGuffin. This is something that takes you on that journey. It might sort of nudge the monarch a little bit along, a bit further towards that status. So that's one layer. But you could be forgiven for thinking that essentially what the monarch's being presented with is a vision of chaos. And that could be quite an alarming and distressing thing. And in fact, we aren't. And this animation will begin to show you how. So we begin with something called a cube octahedron. So like a cube with the corners lopped off. And you can see that we can expand that out into a cube by unlopping the corners. We can also expand it the other way, unlop the corners differently. And the shape that we get is an octahedron. This is why the one in the middle that twins them is called a cube octahedron. So these two forms, the cube and the octahedron, they're twinned. And we're going to move them down here to start operating on them. First of all, we're going to divide this into thirds. So just bear that in mind, but ignore the white lines a little bit because they're just there to show you that it's thirds and it will help as the lecture progresses. The red lines, like a laser, is where we're going to cut this. Cut it through. Tilted square projection of the rhombic dodecahedron through a cube. Whoosh, and we get our rhombic dodecahedron. This is an intrinsic part of its mathematics. Now let's take our twin doctahedron. So this is mathematically twinned with that cube, okay? We're going to mark it up the same way. We don't need to show the thirds now because it just goes straight across. But we did that with a hexagram, with lines, parallel lines running across, and that makes a rhombic dodecahedron. It makes the same rhombic dodecahedron. Not any old rhombic dodecahedron. Those parts that are twinned make the same rhombic dodecahedron. It's going to do another lap, so let's move on. (laughs) If you recall what we did to the cube, we can reveal that this is the underlying geometry, the precise geometry of the Cosmati pavement, which, prior to my research, nobody seems to have written about. To, To be honest, if I'm not the person who's seen this lately, if there's someone else in a paper published by Brill or somebody that I can't afford to access or I don't know about. I would love to meet that person because then we can have a little club. Um, so there's not a great deal of vanity about this, but it, it's just the case that the deluxe editions that have recently been published with the conservation of the Cosmati pavement, wonderful works, but I feel I want to tuck an addendum into the end because this powerful geometry is really what underpins that important pavement. So the king sitting in the middle is sitting right in the very centre of that rhombic dodecahedron. That thing that maybe in Plato and also in Ezekiel is being used as an allegory, as an emblem, if we want to go in that direction, is a MacGuffin. It's taking you on a journey. It's taking you somewhere. Eventually, you can abandon this as an idea. But for the time being, it's taking you into this idea of fitting together into a perfect society. And that's what they want the person on that throne to do, not to chop people's heads off or take you into unnecessary wars. So that's one level. It gets better. Boom. Around this tilted square, we have four hexagons. Remember I said all these panels around the outside are individual. These panels here are conspicuous by 
them being identical. They're all hexagons. All the others have different shapes. These are all hexagons. And they're the same diameter as the stone where the king or queen sits. What's this all about? Well, this is about those four projections through that octahedron. So to visualise this, we now have a, an animation of the garnet flying through a kind of Menga sponge-esque hollowed out cube. So it's the same, these are the same cu cube and octahedron as we had before, but we've cut out those emanations, those, those projections, so that you can see it fitting and see how the same one slots four ways, like an Egyptian pyramid. Think about the top if it helps rather than thinking about the bottom. But you can see there are four beams. So there are three beams going through a cube. One might think about the scutum fidei, that, again, an emblem, a symbol. It's just something that gets you on the journey a little way to understanding the Trinity, where God the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit come together in God. Well, you get three beams coming together in this way, and you might think about perhaps the Gospel writers, who number four, or perhaps the Tetragrammaton, the four Hebrew letters of the name of God in the Old Testament, to be the other one. But they both do the same thing, and they're both encapsulated within the Cosmati pavement. This is its most profound meaning. And the pattern, um, I'm going to wreck my own plan and actually zoom back. This pattern, I said I won't go too much into the Anglo-Saxon things, but you know, try and stop me. This is seen in the Millefury glasswork in the Staffordshire Hoard Anglo-Saxon treasure. It's also seen in the Sutton Hoo treasure in the shoulder clasps, that exact pattern. Henry III's revival, it crops up again in the most sacred civic space in the country. So, there we go. That was the uh, 13th century view. What can we expect in the 14th century? Well, things get a little bit wilder and stranger, as you're probably expecting. There's this extraordinary manuscript tradition of something that they call the Holy Almondal. Now, to put this in perspective, the number of manuscripts that survive of this phenomenon are seriously non-trivial. You could probably take every copy of the Venerable Bede and the Anglo-Saxon Chronicle, lump in a few other texts, and there are fewer of those than there are of these. There are a lot of them. Now, what they purport to do is summon an angel. Shock horror. The later you get, the more ridiculous their claims. The later you get, the more from the core text they deviate. And by the end of it, they're saying, oh, yeah, you know, like, you have wings. My one had wings. Yours didn't. You know, it, it all gets very, very ridiculous. And um, the canonical text on this by um, Veenstra is really worth getting and having a look at because it's absolutely fascinating. Um, but it reproduces some of the diagrams that have been drawn over the ages in these manuscripts. And they're all different. So the first thing you have to think is, well, this is in an age before printing where things were copied out by hand. And it appears that where traditionally you would send out somebody who was literate, I want a copy of this book. You'd send them out. A year later, they would come back and say, I've copied it for you. I went to the monastery of XYZ. I've copied your book. Here it is. And they decided they were going to add little bits in, change bits, because it was exciting. And I'm making these sound like really quite some people. But you've got to remember this is a century of the Black Death and people were quite desperate and there was a lot of emotion and difficulty in that era and so perhaps be a bit uncharitable to sort of say these people are pious frauds and all the rest of it. Something originally impressed somebody so much that this strange tradition gained traction and is a non-trivial thing that we have to deal with. History doesn't care about our opinions. We have to approach it and work out what is going on. Well, the answer to that is within the text itself, the core text, the one that remains the same, the, the bit in the middle. And that says, take four candlesticks and four candles, four candles, um, get a wax altar and suspend it on those candlesticks. Cut holes for incense smoke to percolate, and you want to cut them through four stars that are in the corners, towards the corners. And this is the really funny bit. 
it says you need to write the name of the angel on the candle, and when it burns down to a particular point, it will appear hovering in the smoke. This is ludicrous. This is a huge manuscript tradition. We have to work out what's going on. Well, you, you can already see it. <laughs> so we have an animation here showing this working. We won't light this up because the fire alarms will go crazy. You need a lot of smoke if you want to make this work. Why is it wax? You can see there we've coloured in the animation to show it as wax. Well, the answer is, if you want to make mitres like this, and we've got a cabinet maker who will tell you, it's really difficult to do. But with wax, you can get a hot knife and you can weld them together by melting the wax. So now all you need to do is make four equilateral triangles and mark them up. And you've seen the previous animation, so you know where this is going. Where the beams come together, lo and behold, you have something hovering in the smoke that is similar to descriptions in Ezekiel, and therefore somebody being loose with words might well describe that as an angel because they don't have a word for hologram in the Middle Ages. So what started as something, potentially a university lecture prop like this, where somebody's explaining geometry, which was one of the things that they talked about in medieval universities ad nauseam, famously way back in time, Plato wrote above the door of the academy, essentially, if you don't know geometry, get lost. Them teaching this, some professor somewhere, Bologna or Oxford, Paris, created something to jazz up a lecture, to actually show some kind of light show creating this effect. And then for about four centuries afterwards, people go absolutely nuts writing manuscripts and embellishing them and adding them and changing them. Every illustration is different, so you can discount all of them. None of them had ever seen it work, but all of them had talked to somebody who was beguiled by something that they saw. And today we see laser shows and we see light shows and all sorts. This was an age with none of that. And you've got the Black Death rolling through and all of these things. And somebody comes along and they stare into your eyes and they say, I have seen a demonstration which blew my mind but it's still that MacGuffin. It's still just a thing that's taking us on a journey. It's progressing the narrative because the second half of that lecture, where they probably went to sleep or went to, you know, they, medieval universities tended to do lectures in pubs. So by the time it gets to the second half, maybe people aren't listening so much. And when it gets to the deep philosophy and theology and they're talking about, you know, sort of being a worthy citizen, that's the bit that turns them off. It's this sort of strange thing at the front, like I've got here. I mean, we made this to be impressive to give that same visceral experience of looking at something and going, whatever he's saying, I'm more interested in what on earth is that? And it's like this, it will, it will distract you. You look at the Cosmati pavement, you're distracted by the story of Egypt. You look at this, you're distracted by the strangeness of it, perhaps the beauty of it, the fact that being, being a bit of a showman, I've elected to put an actual 14th century incense burner into this, so there's a little bit of that original tradition in the room. That showmanship, perhaps being beguiling, takes a little bit away from the, um, from the more sober philosophical side. And so we started with a manuscript tradition that's non-trivial, that everyone wants to pretend doesn't exist. <laughs> it's a little bit embarrassing, it's a bit strange, it's superstition in the Middle Ages, and actually we're beginning to engage with a higher level in the universities, perhaps that scholastic period of people engaging with this material. And it made an impact, it made a huge impact, which has been until now completely unrecognised because people haven't been looking for it. Or if they found it, if they found it, they might think, I don't want to go down that direction. I don't want to talk about one of the nation's most beloved monuments. This is one of the ruins that I said we were going to talk about. It's a lovely ruin, but it is a ruin. The inside of it's completely hollowed out from the English Civil War period onwards. Bodium Castle. This is a roughly square castle. It's a bit longer, not quite playing card dimensions, but it's roughly square. And it has round towers on the corners, but those round towers contain a secret, and that secret, you have probably guessed, is that each one of them is a hexagonal shaft. So each one of them is vibing with the Cosmati pavement, is vibing deeply with Ezekiel. What do people say about Bodium 
they look at that, the chapel, which protrudes and breaks the symmetry. They look at the giant window in the chapel. They look at the large windows that pierce the walls. They look at the thinness of the walls and they look at the shallowness of the moat and they say, this isn't really a castle. This couldn't withstand a siege. What is this man, Dallingridge, doing, building this thing? He's a veteran of the wars in France. He was training up knights in his retirement when he built this castle. So there is sort of military applications to this research because it isn't about military hardware. This is about concepts of chivalry. This is about concepts of management of people, of cohering as a team and a society, the things that you need on the battlefield. Because frankly, if you're being besieged in England in your wars with France, you're doing something wrong. So yes, it was technically to guard the south coast, but really what's going on here is that the new chivalry of that century with Edward III founding the Order of the Garter, all of these things going on with heraldry, that emblematic culture of heraldry that's going on within this building where the people who were brought through here and were made from squires into knights and sent abroad were people who understood their place within the Cosmati pavement a century before. And that coherence, that cultural coherence, was the thing for which this castle was powerful. It's why it was built this way. It accounts for the peculiarities in its features. So some people have called it a sham castle. It's not a sham castle at all because it genuinely defended the kingdom, but it defended the kingdom through the behaviour, through the philosophy and the religion of its inhabitants rather than through the stones themselves. It's about meaning. Let's move into the 15th century. So I've talked quite a bit about how all the manuscripts go wrong because you have to send somebody out who may or may not be trustworthy to copy something, and the level of embellishment gets frankly comical with that Almondal tradition that moved so far beyond the core text and whatever it originally was that I believe is this, it turned into something really quite strange and ridiculous. That all changed with the advent of printing, and you might be wondering if you know about the Liber Chronicarum, why there's the number 1497 there for a date. Because the Liber Chronicarum is famous, it was worked on by Albrecht Dürer when he was a kid. Well, 16 years old, I was an adult back then. But it was one of the most successful early printed books and it was begun in 1491 before Columbus sailed. So these images, the woodcuts, were manufactured while Columbus was finding America. But I put 1497 because this is the edition where I have some leaves here in the room which you can have a look at afterwards and I'll, I'll show to you now. This is a pi this pirate treasure, this is a pirated version from Augsburg. So my putting it this way is being a bit cheeky but what I'm showing here is there is a huge fidelity in information, even something pirated within that incunable period, that cradle period of printing, the first couple of decades of printing. Even something pirated has the same lines, it's very precise. Suddenly the replication of knowledge has become more reliable and it's reaching large groups of people. We no longer have the problem of somebody producing a text, someone misunderstanding it, and then that misunderstanding becoming the only surviving tradition of that scholarship whatsoever. We're in a very, very different land now dealing with this. The Liber Chronicarum was also important because it was a picture book. There were lots of chronicles that went through world history from creation all through the seven ages of exegesis, all this sort of thing. This section comes from the bit about the Babylonian exile, which is a whole section, one of the seven ages. So this is actually relating to Ezekiel, and this is Ezekiel's temple. It's based on the descriptions of the temple in Ezekiel, where Ezekiel is talking about the politics and everything that was going on, the wars, and what was going on in Jerusalem, all of these themes coming together. Well, they're now interested in architecture, and you can see clearly how castle architecture is colouring their vision of historically what that temple may have been like. Um, and this is disseminated everywhere, and everyone suddenly, for the first time, 
they not only see an image, which they may have seen in a manuscript book before, but they see an image that has a publisher that a thousand other people have also bought and said this is okay. There's a new confidence in what you're reading, um, that this is something that there's a group of you who all sort of believe the same thing. And that's going to become important when we move into the 16th century. Now, I want to begin with running through the life of Matthew Parker very, very quickly, um, because this will help to knit everything together. So Matthew Parker started life um, up in Norwich, and he entered Corpus Christi. His life could have gone in any direction, but he carried on with theology, and he rose within the college and became a fellow. He was noticed as being a Protestant theologian, and he was taken on as the private chaplain of Anne Boleyn. Not the greatest gig to get, for obvious reasons. You know, hindsight is a wonderful thing. When Anne Boleyn was executed, he was essentially made into the godfather of Elizabeth Tudor, the daughter of Anne Boleyn. Um, and Henry VIII, who had no problem with Matthew Parker, he was one of the people who helped figure out what's going to go with the split from Rome. You know, they were friendly, despite the execution of his employer. Henry said, be master of Corpus Christi. That's your job. That gets you away from courts. That smooths over this difficult period. And so Matthew Parker not only became the master of Corpus, he became the most energetic vice chancellor the University of Cambridge has ever had. When the dissolution rolled through, there was a possibility that the University of Cambridge itself was going to have all its endowments stripped and be dissolved, gone. Parker was on the commission who worked out how to re-endow the university and protect that institution. So it's incredibly important. Rose to being the Dean of Lincoln, and if you've ever visited Lincoln Cathedral, you know what an honour that is to become Dean of Lincoln. Um, of course, Mary Tudor eventually came to the throne after her brother died. Um, so the succession, you have Henry splitting from Rome, you have Edward who is Protestant, Mary who is Catholic, and suddenly Matthew Parker who is married, which is not what can happen within the Catholic dispensation of things, um, is sticks, it's sticking out like a sore thumb. And a lot of Protestant theologians at that time fled to the continent, to Germany, where the Reformation started. Matthew Parker disappeared in England and didn't go abroad. But he was stripped of all offices, and the writings that we do have about where he went, it certainly wasn't in the east of England, because everyone knew who he was. He was a massive celebrity, having all of these extraordinary posts. So it was somewhere else that he hid away. Um, and he said he was constantly pursued until he found somewhere that he would rather stay for the rest of his life. And as soon as Elizabeth I came to the throne and it flopped back to Protestantism, he had to be dragged almost kicking and screaming to the throne of St Augustine to be made Archbishop of Canterbury. He said, I want to retire. I've been translating the Psalms. I've been enjoying it. Thomas Tallis later put those Psalms to music. And then, if you know Th Fantasia on a theme by Thomas Tallis, Vaughan Williams, that's based on Tallis, which is with the words from Matthew Parker. So, really interesting guy who, in the end, is responsible for founding the Church of England by coordinating the 39 Articles, by bringing that Elizabeth, Elizabethan religious settlement together with this extraordinary sort of securitist career. So that's Matthew Parker, and it's worth sort of bearing that in mind as we progress. Back to architecture. There's this extraordinary house in Shropshire. Thank you to Tim for arranging the venue. It, it's Tim's family who have been there since forever. Um, that forever began with this extraordinary man, Sir Rowland Hill. And Sir Rowland Hill started his career before the Reformation, a long time before the Reformation, um, and was into all sorts of extraordinary things, but his trade was a mercer, a merchant. And he was incredibly prominent and successful in that. Henry VIII had to borrow money off him constantly, and there are some amusing anecdotes of that in the state papers. And when everything fell apart with the dissolution, when suddenly people realised that the, the hospitals were all taken care of by monks and nuns, and suddenly that wasn't working anymore in the schools. He founded schools, he founded hospitals, he was the first director of the, um, uh, the Bethlehem Hospital, Bedlam Hospital. When that was wound down as a monastic foundation, he stepped in with other mercers in the city. 
um, and also a bridewell that at that time was a sort of like a job centre mixed with a poorhouse prison, mixed with a hospital. It was a very strange outfit. But they used to match people up with apprenticeships there. So the population explosion that happened during that century, he was onto it. The plagues, he was onto it. With all this work with hospitals and everything else, he had a finger in every pie. Extraordinary thing. One of the most unexpected, perhaps, things for somebody that busy to be doing was that all of those Protestant exiles, unlike Matthew Parker, they all went to the continent. They gathered at Geneva and they produced an English Bible, waiting for potentially Protestantism to return to England. And it was published by Roland Hill. It was on his ships, waiting to go, and across it came. So it was the first Bible of the newly founded Matthew Parker Elizabeth iteration of the Church of England. It's really quite extraordinary. That became the Bible of Oliver Cromwell, of the Pilgrim Fathers. You know, it's really influential. And the frontispiece to it, uh, sorry, not the frontispiece, such as the, um, the foreword to it, talks about the Temple of Solomon. So we've seen that being important, obviously, in Ezekiel. It's important in the Liber Chronicarum. And it's important in the Geneva Bible. And you can see how he based his house on the aesthetics, the balance of that. And something that's not in this photograph is the precinct wall that goes around, a square precinct that this cubic house sits within, has steps on the front, the, en the entrance avenue. So it's got this three-step nature, like the three-step nature of the Temple of Solomon. So to anybody who only had this in their local church or in their hand, looking at this really extraordinary building for its date, built in the latter years of Queen Mary's reign, we'd sort of go, oh, okay, this is to do with the Temple of Solomon. But it gets even more involved than that, because the coin stones, stones up the edge here, are the same number as the different layers on the tower of St. Bennet's in Cambridge. It's the church connected to Corpus Christi, the Anglo-Saxon church that was also the Senate house of the university through all of that time. So really the most central building in the University of Cambridge, the other side of the country. And it's sort of being referenced here. And the one thing you need to complete it looking the same is this Anglo-Saxon long and short work where you've got a great big long column and then a big flat stone that comes out. It's very distinctive Anglo-Saxon architecture. And you have these very curious distinctive window frames which does the same sort of thing. And the first time I saw it, I swore very loudly because this was, I've studied Anglo-Saxon things, I've studied country houses, and why is there this strange chimera of artistic sensibilities coming together? What's he, what's he all about? Well, Matthew Parker begins to make a bit of sense of that because we don't know where Parker went, but it looks like he may have been here because Roland Hill, who was the first Protestant Lord Mayor of London, responsible for protecting, funding all of these Protestant theologians in Geneva, in his house in Geneva, he published their Bible. He's referencing Corpus Christi in his house, as well as the Temple of Solomon. So that feels like it's a long way towards a theory of answering exactly where it was that Parker ended up. And also being quite peaceful in, in Shropshire. It explains why he was so reluctant to, uh, to give up on it and to suddenly be thrust back into public life because it actually had quite a nice internal exile in this part of the country where people don't go looking for things. And people haven't gone looking for things, which is why Sultan's gone unnoticed. Another reason is because it looks later than it should be because the top was lopped off. You can see in Hill's coat of arms that he had drawn up himself. He had a family coat of arms. He had his own maid. There are three towers. Well... You've got to imagine a pyramid roof above that, and instead of the, the chimneys there, the chimneys are up inside little sort of castellations on the corners. So it would have looked, with a belvedere on top of the pyramid, like there were three towers when you're approaching up that avenue. So you've got all these different games, Tudor games that are being played in this extraordinary house, and they're relating to these ideas. So what of the philosophy beyond it being connected to the Temple of Solomon? Well, you can see the facade is divided into three and into three in the brick part we have a nine grid, we have a three by three grid, and you can see where this is going. The precinct that it's set in, you can divide up into a three by three grid using that square footprint of the house. 
and the lot that it's on within that grid is 55 feet by 55 feet. So hang on to 55 feet by 55 feet. The precinct is 55 yards by 55 yards. That's the way the imperial system works, three feet in a yard. What's significant about that? Well, 55 yards by 55 yards is the exact dimension of the Telesterion at Eleusis. So the great cult centre for Plato, Aristotle, everyone in Athens, they went twice a year in the mysteries from Athens down the road to Eleusis, to this giant square temple. For the mysteries, they're connected with the pomegranate. What is a pomegranate to us? It has these little red fleshy seeds that grow up against each other with little flat sides. And our word garnet comes from garanatus seeded pomegranate. So it's connected to the pomegranate, certainly later on. So these people are thinking, OK, pomegranates, we think we know what the Greeks were up to. We think we know what may be the answer to Plato's Timaeus, the answer to what's going on at Eleusis that's in these documents that we're reading during the Renaissance. We're beginning to come to an understanding, OK, that actually this all works together. This gels with what we've been doing in England all the way back into Anglo-Saxon history, and you can see it on the coronation pavement. So they're doing that there. Mirabile dictu. But we have some things to back us up with some of these outrageous suggestions. So this house, this is another one. Well, I think this is the first one that's completely obliterated in our run through. Uh, Bachy Graig in North Wales, not a million miles away from Salton, which is near the Welsh border. This house was built by Richard Clough, who's Welsh. Guess what? He was a mercer. And not only a mercer, he was the right hand man of Thomas Gresham, who was the Tweedledee to Rowland Hill's Tweedledum. They were great friends. These people were all in a very tight knit group. And it was Clough's job to be on the continent during this time, managing the affairs of Gresham and probably also in the way they all work together, some of the affairs of Rowland Hill. These are all very, very tight knit group. He builds builds for himself in 1567, so a little bit later than Sultan, the first brick house in Wales, and it's a square with a pyramidal <coughs> roof. It looks like it should be 17th century or 18th century. We're used to seeing sort of, you know, think colonial Williamsburg or, you know, those, those sort of styles of things with those pyramidal roofs. We're seeing this with the Belvedere on top, with the pyramid, and we're seeing that in the same circle of people. So that really gives us his friend and <coughs> colleague, Roland Hill's house, what the top of it looked like before that top was lost. And you can begin to see how it all fits together. So that's um, another house that is, that is concerned with this. If you're eagle-eyed, you'll also spot how there are three windows on the side of this Belvedere. So it's almost like that has become a nine grid, a three by three grid as well. So the whole thing is almost fractal. It emanates. And this idea of that 4D shape being lobbed through into our three dimensions. If you put something four dimensional through 3D space, it'll grow. If you imagine putting a 4D ball through, where's it come from? It's come from somewhere that, that isn't here. So it starts off as a point, it grows, and then it diminishes. So this idea of it growing, this rhombic dodecahedron growing and engulfing the whole kingdom in this sort of could say allegory, MacGuffin. It's the thing that's taking us a journey, but it's something to do with grace. It's something to do with reaching further into philosophy and growth. With it doing that, you can then see the house at Sultan. I'll click back. Within its precinct, it's set against the back of the precinct. It's set to back against Wales with the precinct in front of it. You can see that unfolding itself. So if the king unfolds on the Cosmati pavement, it radiates throughout the kingdom. This is Roland Hill trying to fix the country, sitting with his back against Wales and going, right, flop out across England, we're going to change it. Things I've said about Eleusis, also a little bit uh, outlandish. Let's bring some hard architectural proof about the philosophy that was going on. A colleague, friend and colleague of Roland Hill and Parker was Dr. Keyes, who was the royal physician all the way through from Henry to Elizabeth consistently. He kept his job, kept his head. He was one of the leading lights and the leader 
of, for a long period of time, the Royal College of Physicians trying to bring in London um, regulation to the medical sector, for which um, he obviously needed a close relationship with those people in the city who are running the hospitals and everything else. So that's, that's how he links with Rowland Hill. Because he was a doctor, because he was interested in medicine, in the spandrels of his gate of honour at his college back in Cambridge, where he was master, he's put all of the strange medicinal substances, the substances from the mysteries of ancient Greece, in here. So you've got a giant poppy head. So you have opium, but these are seen at Eleusis. So we sent somebody out, somebody has knowledge of Eleusis, remember that 55 yards. The pomegranate for Persephone at Eleusis. You've got leaves there. I don't know what those leaves are. They could be laurels. They could be um, possibly penny royal, which is part of the liquid at Eleusis that they were drinking. Um, you've got barley, again, for the mysteries of Eleusis, and what are probably grapes. So you've got all of the different bits of the Greek mysteries. It's not like in some churches you see decoration where it's grapes and it's grain because this is the bread and the wine, this is the Eucharist, this has got poppies in it and pomegranates. This is talking directly to Greece, it's talking directly to medicine. His personal symbol was the, uh, the rod of Asclepius, which is a little bit confused with the Mercury's uh, rod. So it's got too many snakes on it, there are four snakes. But he had one of these silver rods to be carried in front of him in Cambridge. And he also gifted another one to the Royal College of Physicians, which they still use in rituals, uh, civic rituals. So you've got all of this sort of classicism going on here. You can also see echoes of the Cosmati pavement, these writhing lines, these squares and circles. Flowers from Eleusis. So we've got the Greek stuff here. This feels like it's pulling in a slightly different direction, a slightly more multi-ethnic kind of direction. How does this relate back to our garnet, our rhombic dodecahedron? Well, the answer is in these plinths. And you can see that these plinths are double cubes. And on each face of the cube, it's got a little lozenge. One of these. In fact, the carpet here, quite amusing, is <laughs> covered in lozenges. This thing, it, once you've seen it, it haunts you. It really does. Um, so you've got these lozenges. How many sides are on a cube? Six. How many sides are on two cubes? Twelve. You've got twelve lozenges. All you need to do in your mind, it's Cambridge, so expect us to think, sometimes. You extrapolate and you've got twelve sides on the double cube. Well, let's explain that double cube. Here's a double cube. And all we have to do is turn one inside out and it makes a rhombic dodecahedron. So double cube, when you see a double cube, what you're looking at is somebody referencing. It's a reference to a reference to a reference, and you can follow this ladder. When I say ladder, you think of the Neoplatonists, the Middle Platonists, they talk about the ladder of ontology, you sort of ascend in understanding. So you can start off with this symbol down here. It's a symbol that relates to another symbol. That symbol relates to another symbol. That symbol relates to another symbol. And chasing this garnet all the way through to this, you need at some point to step off the garnet train because you need to start thinking about higher dimensions. You need to start thinking about ethics. So it doesn't get you all the way. That's, again, back to the idea of that being a MacGuffin. It's not the whole story. It's something that sort of, it's the first semester of your curriculum. And here it is. I will... Um, here it is in the Gate of Honour, where graduates, only graduates graduating and fellows, doctors of the college can pass through that gate. This is the Gate of Honour. There are three gates. You progress up that ladder through those gates. This is the sum of that transformative process. This is the knowledge that does that. If it transforms somebody into a king in Westminster, here it's transforming somebody into a graduate of the University of Cambridge, of Gonville and Keys College specifically. Let's talk about Nicholas Bacon. So we're embedded now thinking about John Keyes being at Cambridge, Parker was at Cambridge, thinking about this group of people. Nicholas Bacon was very, very important in this story because he graduated in the year that Matthew Parker became a fellow. They were contemporaries, they were friends, they were lifelong friends. And eventually Nicholas Bacon was 
Parker's executor. And Bacon was a great friend of Elizabeth I because, of course, if you're friends with Matthew Parker, who's the godfather of Elizabeth, it's a really tight-knit group of people, but he was immediately made Lord Great Seal by Elizabeth, great office of state, and he was one of the two people, it was him and it was Cecil, who dragged Parker to the throne of St Augustine. When Parker died, he left something quite extraordinary, and it was Nicholas Bacon who did the organising. He left about a quarter of the world's Anglo-Saxon documents to Corpus Christi College, Cambridge, his old college. Why did he have these? Well, he had these in order to found the Church of England. You needed these books. He had special dispensation to go and collect them together in order to do the scholarship. The kind of scholarship that was going on in Geneva is suddenly in turbo drive because now it's suddenly related to has the Church of England been independent before? Has it been unique before? What are its characteristics? How do we do things? What does Protestant architecture look like? What does our art look like? What is our language? All of these questions were up in the air, all of these questions being answered by bringing together all of those manuscripts, making print editions of them, doing the scholarship, and that was what Parker did initially at Lambeth. And when he died, he left all of these to Corpus, and remember John Keyes, his friend? Gonville and Keyes College is one of the auditors of this bequest. If a single book goes missing, it's audited, the whole lot goes to Gonville and Keys, and if they lose any, it all goes to Trinity Hall. So you have these close networks of how all of these things are bound together, and Corpus is still a repository of these extraordinary works, one of the most important of which you may have seen at the coronation, they used for the first time for that process, the book they use to invest archbishops in Canterbury, it's kept at Corpus Christi, it's the Canterbury Gospels, said to be the book carried by St Augustine in 597, when he came to convert the people of Kent given to him by Pope and St Gregory the Great. Extraordinary book. They're all wearing togas. It's so early. So early they're wearing togas. But these books didn't have a home because the college didn't have room for them. The man who stepped in was the executor of Matthew Parker. It was Nicholas Bacon who had the means. And it was Bacon who paid for a new chapel, which you can see on the left. And his bequest was memorialised in this wonderful doorway into the antechapel. That row of three windows you can see at the top of the chapel are the original Parker Library. They had to wait to ship the library to live above the chapel until Bacon had quickly made a building that could actually house them securely. And that's where they lived until the remodelling of the college in the 19th century. So now it's, it's bigger and grander, but the, the chapel's still on the same footprint. Something that survives from that original chapel um, and this is a picture of how the chapel was before the rebuilding programme, is the floor. But something we've lost that is a bit of a shame is the ceiling. And if you count the bays and you work it out, there are 12 of these pendants. So it's almost like the 12 apostles or the 12 sides of this, this jobby. The knowledge, the holiness is dripping from the ceiling, from this extraordinary repository of our nation's soul into the chapel below. And the floor has this distinctive pattern. This is not the first time that this has been used. This pattern's also in Henry III's retable, the, the sort of splashback on the altar, the altar back, which is preserved now in the, um, in, in the galleries at, at, at uh, Westminster Abbey. You can visit it. But there's this pattern of octagons and squares, and you've all seen it. It's on everybody's bathroom floor, in orangeries, everywhere. You know, it, it's so much everywhere that you don't see it anymore. Here's a rhombic dodecahedron, and for the first time I'm going to prove to you that they do fit together into 3D volume, and there's a reason for this. We're going to put together a layer of them, and then, it sort of feels like an egg box or something, we're going to slot in another layer. It'll become obvious why they're differently coloured, the two layers, because we're going to slice through, and what we're left with is that pattern. So what's going on with that floor? Well, there are lots of different ways that you can slice rhombic dodecahedrons filling space. You can make just an ordinary checkerboard. That, that happens. 
um, again, hexagons like honeycomb. And in fact, the way that bees cap the end of their honeycomb is with the half of one of these, that shape you will see in nature in, in honeycomb. So you could slice it through many ways, but this way you can't mistake it for being anything else. You can get hexagons by accident fitting together. You can sort of work it out by overlapping circles and then just go, aha, you know, you can have that moment. You can do the same thing with a checkerboard, just squares laid out. You can do that by accident. But making this design is a choice. It is a choice. Let's look at some more buildings that have to do with the Temple of Solomon as we progress through this century. I'll start with this one, Wallace and Hall, because everybody under the sun has written about how this is the same as the Temple of Solomon. Um, you can see here in the Augsburg, or indeed the, the Nuremberg Chronicle, because the woodcuts are the same, but you can see how these early images, what the Temple of Solomon might be like, influence these, what they call bartizans, these round projecting corner bits probably don't have anything to do with biblical period, biblical architecture. They have a lot to do with this firm tradition of depictions from that first phase of printing. So Mark Gerard has written a lot about the relationship of this with Temple of Solomon. Um, James Stevens Curl has written about this. This is quite well described, how this house... Sultan, I think, is a little bit more subtle about it, but this house is just full force going, we've made a Temple of Solomon house. We've read the Geneva Bible, it says that the country is going to be remade through following the example of the Temple of Solomon, following the example of Ezekiel, and that's what that house is doing. And then we can pass into the 17th century, and we hit this chap, very famous, so-called father of science and philosophy and all these ideas, Francis Bacon. What Bacon did was not really invent the scientific method. That's what a lot of people say about his philosophy. Actually, what he, what he did that was new and set a new course was he said that it's all about the fruits. As soon as somebody says something, so, oh, James, you're standing at the front talking about this sort of stuff, you know, what's it have to do with the price of bread? Is that what's it have to do with the price of bread part of it? That was what he hinged on. Don't entertain ideas because they're beguiling. Think back to what went wrong with the Almondale thing, everyone doing bonkers things that were all different. Don't be beguiled by things. Try it out and see if it works. Does it produce fruit? What are the fruits? This is the big question of Francis Bacon. Bacon was the son of Bacon, Nicholas Bacon, the Bacon that we've been talking about in the previous century. And this Bacon, son of the previous one, also rose to high office. In the reign of Elizabeth, when he was a little boy, he used to be nicknamed by her, my little Lord Seal, because you've got the great Lord Seal, which is father, and he would sort of run around behind doing the chores, and you know, he was, he was a bit of a prodigy and was always had a, a wit to him. When he first met Queen Elizabeth, she sort of said, well, how old are you? And he said something like, um, two years younger than the start of your happy reign, or something like that. And she just went, you little twerp, but you know, you've got a brain on you. So he rose through the court and, and did all of this sort of thing. He was placed at Trinity College rather than Corpus Christi. Corpus Christi was his father's college, but he was placed at Trinity because there was a man who was going to become the Archbishop of Canterbury who was available there as a tutor. So really it was following the tutor more than to do with the institution. And this has led people a bit off the path with understanding his intellectual life because they, you look up Wikipedia or something, you say, oh, he went to Trinity. He's not really connected. How does, it doesn't quite work. But that was the reason. His heart and soul was really in Corpus. And... I'll get on to that in a minute. He published famously books of philosophy, books of early science, theology, legal arguments and theory. He wrote a huge amount, so much so that some misguided people think he might have been Shakespeare. That's, that's not true. Um, he, he didn't have time for that. Indeed, most of his works he never finished, so this man did not have enough time to be involved in some kind of strange conspiracy. That was not where he was at. Mostly, he walked around his gardens with cheap people running behind him. So young lads who could be given a shilling and they would they write down everything that he said. So his house was full of random papers, like post-it notes. And one of these men was Thomas Hobbes. <laughs> that's, that's just a little anecdote aside. That's not really important for for this, but you can get the flavour of it. He was, he was picking people who were bright, but who didn't cost very much because he was always, always broke and eventually sort of got bankrupt because he spent too liberally on all of his various protégés. Um, 
when his works were finally gathered together and printed, most of them after his death, they have really interesting frontispieces. And this is one of them. And this says mundus inter intellectualis, the intellectual world, as opposed to the sensible world, the world of material sense experience. So this is Platonism. This is talking about there being a different realm from the material world that we're kind of corporeally trapped in. And it's between two pillars. And oh my word, we've got beams of light and we've got pillars and you can begin to see some resonances going on here with all of this tradition, how much he knew. And this ball of enlightenment sort of appears in the middle. This is deeply weird stuff. But it's here. And like the Almondale manuscripts, we've got to deal with it because history doesn't care about our opinions, it does its own thing, and this is what it did. So you've got the New Atlantis that Francis Bacon wrote, and in New Atlantis, the story is some sailors get blown off course, they land on an island somewhere, and the people there quarantine them and then gradually explain they know about the rest of the world, the rest of the world doesn't know about them. They go out into the world and collect knowledge, have spies that collect all of the technology and bring it together. And where they bring it together is a thing called the College of the Six Days Works, or the House of Solomon. So that exhortation that starts with the Geneva Bible saying, if we want to make things right, we've got to emulate the Temple of Solomon. It's written very explicitly in the New Atlantis, it's the Temple of Solomon that you want. And this College of the Six Days Works was or I should say, is, is taken universally by scholars as being the origin of the modern research university. The first time they said a university isn't about disputations and about bringing people together so much as it is about setting research objectives and sending out researchers into the world. Not just talking about things in a lecture hall and buying books, it's about going out, doing experiments. So the modern research university is said to have started with the New Atlantis and its vision, later went on to influence the foundation of the Royal Society, to the extent that even though that was after Bacon's death, the frontispiece of their first sort of great birth certificate, as it were, has his bust in the middle of it, saying this man is the intellectual originator of this idea, but it's connected with the Temple of Solomon, therefore connected to Ezekiel, but also connected to the Geneva Bible. So we've got all of these things sloshing along together. I said he liked to walk around his gardens being chaotic, this is where he was walking. <laughs> and this is, uh, this is the second building that is completely destroyed. It was destroyed during the Civil War. It's broken up for building materials because it was in a, in a ruinous state. You can see how this is based on salt and how this is based on Bachy Greig with a pyramidal roof with a belvedere. You can see these round towers on the corners of the belvedere similar to those early printed depictions of the Temple of Solomon. You can see how it's kind of a nine grid because you've got the way that's sort of set up and you've got these corner ornaments as well. So it's a little bit like Sultan because they're popping out. They're not towers like Bodium, they're, they're, they're popping out and they're being quite explicit about that. Interestingly enough, I mentioned piracy before. This is another example of piracy because the only drawing that was ever made of this was by John Aubrey, the great antiquarian, and the people who published this print of that drawing ransacked the Bodleian for all of his papers and then produced this without permission. And then, it, then they got shut down. So there are a vanishingly small number of these, and uh, thank you very much to Tim uh, for calling up these images from the Bodleian, and thank you to the Bodleian as well. Um, <laughs> because this is an image that most people have never seen because it's so desperately obscure. But Francis Bacon, this towering figure in the history of Western thought, this is what he chose to build for himself. And we've got to deal with it, because history doesn't care about our opinions. We've just got to deal with that. Let's move on to another house, Lulworth Castle. I could lecture for more than one semester entirely on this house. This is absolutely extraordinary. Um, you can see immediately similarities. You can see their similarities with Verulam House, with the sort of the thinness of the, the windows. You can see the corner towers are like Bodium. Um, another feature is that there's this rose window. Um, you kind of have to ignore the form of the tracery inside the rose window because that was restored and we don't quite know whether it matched the original. But the rose window itself is original and it's depicted, albeit a, a round blob, in very, very early drawings and engravings of that, of, of that house. 
This has been called a sham castle. If you read any literature about it, all they say is the meaning of this building is that it evokes chivalry. It's not a castle. It, it's not defendable in any way. But we've learnt with Bodium that that isn't really the game that they're playing. You can see here from the Nuremberg Chronicle, the Augsburg, 14, 1491 through this image, Rose Window. So where did the idea, where did this outlandish idea for a rose window come from? And why is it standing between two figures of Hercules? Well, those pillars in Bacon, the pillars of Hercules, it's an imperial symbol that was used, the Spanish sailing out between the pillars of Hercules, the entrance to the Mediterranean. That's sort of where those columns came from in print history, going into, into those frontispieces pieces of Bacon. So maybe it's sort of to do with that, but what is in here, the intellectual world, well, it's coming from the Temple of Solomon. So we can see a house doing that, and then we can look at some more features of it. Boom! The inside of the towers. You could have guessed, they're all hexagons. Back to the Cosmati pavement, back to this Almondal idea. All hexagons. They didn't have to be hexagons, and we know they didn't have to be hexagon, because the very top level you can only reach from the roof. They used those as storerooms and for water tanks and things, and it's round. So only the rooms where your guests that you want to be drinking from this cup of knowledge, where they're staying it's a hexagon because they need to see it. Where they don't need to see it, you don't bother. So the hexagons are important. It's not just structural, it's not just the history of mason craft, you know, as an operative sort of bit of building. This is much more thrusting towards speculative Freemasonry almost, which is a long way away in history. But you've got these ideas now that actually the meaning about this is the most important thing. Preservation of meaning is the only meaningful preservation. In the middle of the house, so dividing it into a nine grid, you've got this staircase tower, and the top of it is essentially a copy of what there was at Sultan. So it's taking the house of the man who published the Bible and was the most extraordinary figure of the previous century, and it's immortalising his house in the middle of a larger explication of the same concepts. A more perfect version of Bodium, because Bodium isn't quite square. This is perfecting these themes, bringing them all together. And there we have Lulworth. Something else about Lulworth that's kind of interesting is that the church there, going all the way back, has a dedication to St Andrew. That's just by chance, that, you know, coincidence of history. Think about St Andrew's Saltire, the cross, flag of Scotland. These are the honours of Scotland, or rather I should say well, this is the crown of Scotland, and on the bonnet of this crown, this exceedingly ancient crown, there are four gold plates with pearls, and if you think about those wheels within wheels in Ezekiel with the hoops of the crown, you've actually got the right angles with these white pearls to sort of irradiate the brain of the wearer with this sort of pearly energy. So the flag of Scotland and the mystical meaning of the honours of Scotland, are all sort of wrapped up together with these same ideas. And something that you see at Lulworth are there are shell-headed niches. So it's not so much about that nine-grid cubic bit, it's, it's more to do with the towers, it's more to do with the diagonal bits. And shells, pearls, St Andrews, and remember this is after James Stewart came down from Scotland. So maybe there's a patriotic Stuart gesture there. This is the Scottish version of these mysteries. This is to do with these shells, to do with the honours of Scotland and, and witnessing, witnessing that statecraft happening. So it's all wrapped up in here and how that all knits in together. It had a fan, fan club, Rupera Castle, which is sadly ruined. So why last night at 3am I was crying over a moth-eaten jacket where I've got a lecture where all of this is happening, I don't know. Humans need that basic thing to latch onto. It's easier, it's easier to grapple with because facing this, we need to sort of keep our spirits up. But you can see how it has these hexagonal insides. Another note on piracy. I've made very careful to cite where I've got images from. This particular one, you can't get in here because it's about to fall down. Um, the, person who <laughs> the person who took this photograph, it wasn't a photograph, it's a film on YouTube of an urban explorer who was trespassing. So I feel absolutely no scruples about nicking a screenshot because if it's stolen to begin with, it, it's got bad face anyway. But it's useful to us, because as scholars, we can look at this rather than a grainy pixelated image on Google Earth, where you can see these towers from above. Knowing how closely this fits, I went to Lulworth Castle last week to take those photographs, spoke to their archivist, 
and he said, well, we haven't been into Lulworth, so we don't really know how closely it matches. Sorry, we haven't been into Rupera. We don't know how closely it matches. And uh, actually doing the ground, well, not doing the groundwork, nicking some groundwork, nicking some groundwork from a trespasser. We're beginning to knit together this, but that is a, that is a square castle with that. Let's loop back a little bit to Verulam House. So obviously something that's curious about John Aubrey's picture of Verulam is that it has these strange corners. And I've said that by projecting, they're evoking the way that Salton projects. They aren't sort of corner towers at Salton so much as projections. But the way they're sort of bows, you would think do a round tower, but they're bows and they've got this corner down the middle to show you, is a little bit peculiar. And I think the answer for that might be remembering that Francis Bacon wrote incessantly to universities of Oxford and Cambridge, and he graduated at Cambridge, and his father was a great benefactor to Cambridge. The Senate House, St. Bennet's, again, you know, part of Corpus Christi College, all of the pillars are like that. And I wonder if that aesthetically didn't make him want to include a little bit of Cambridge in his design, and the way these funny lobed corners sort of almost remind him of where he graduated, because he was so into his scholarship. So there's a, there's a little bit of an extra. It's not really philosophical. It's more just sort of a sentimental connection. But I thought it was worth bringing up. So you remember I said that, first of all, Francis Bacon's heart was really in Corpus Christi, not in Trinity, <laughs> where his father put him. And secondly, that he used to run around the gardens with people trailing after him, writing post-it notes. Well, these post-it notes were put together. Bacon didn't write any of his books as books. They were, they were compiled edited, sent to the printers, the whole thing was done by his chaplain, and he only had one chaplain, private chaplain, all the way through his life. And that man was William Rawley, William Rawley Senior, who was a fellow of Corpus Christi. Being a fellow in that time, and to a greater or lesser extent today, there are different kinds of fellowships today, but being a fellow at that time was for life in the sense that you were always connected with the college, but it meant that you were physically there teaching. So he ceased to be a fellow when he started doing all of this other stuff, like becoming rector of Land Beach. So the living of a church is the ability to choose the rector there, the person who takes the tides who lives in that area. You appoint the rector, that's the living. Corpus owned a number of livings, like Grantchester near Cambridge, St. Bennett's, as I said, was a part of the college. Another close one to Cambridge was Land Beach. And it was one that traditionally is associated with very, very senior members of the college. It had been the living that Matthew Parker had when he was master. So you can imagine the sort of the feeling of being the rector at Land Beach is this great position to occupy, where you're almost a kind of a new kind of fellow out in the world, still intimately connected with the college and its intellectual life. So William Rawley was the rector of Land Beach all the way through from 1616 until his death. The period of his being the chaplain to Francis Bacon, and then being one of the more energetic members of the ecclesiastical household as a royal chaplain after Bacon's death for Charles I, all the way through the Civil War and the Republic, to being a royal chaplain very active for Charles II. This man was the continuity of the Anglican Church during that period, where it was essentially dismantled during that Cromwellian period. He was holding all of that together. But the period when he was working for Bacon, he published everything that they say Bacon published during that period. That was all Rawley. And Rawley wrote The Life of Bacon, which is in, in here, published along with the New Atlantis and everything else in this book. It's all bound in together. It's got Rawley's name on the front. He is doing all of the work and he is completely embedded within the Corpus Christi project. What was the Corpus Christi project at that time? Obviously in the time of Parker, it was founding the Church of England, it was bringing those Anglo-Saxon books, it was doing those things in that moment. What was it doing during the Civil War? They actually took custody of the entire Archiepiscopal Library of Lambeth and we have the receipts for that for the entire duration of the Civil War and the Republic. So that time of disruption in the Church of England, the place that is the ark, the repository for those things at that time, for Lambeth, was at Corpus Christi. And Rawley is this very active fellow, right in the middle, one of the signatories of the various bills, hiding the silver under the floorboards, 
doing all the other things, protecting this knowledge during that period of upheaval. Raleigh's at the thick of it, and then he helps with the restoration. So really, he's a towering figure, and nobody knows his name. Because everyone says, ah, Francis Bacon published something, and they imagine that Francis Bacon went to the publishing house and said, another one, print it, please. And that's not true. He never lifted a finger. He was philosophising in the gardens with Thomas Hobbes running after him, writing post-it notes, and, and William Rawley put it all together. The heir of William Rawley was going to be William Rawley Jr., his son. And this was a real tragedy for the college. So William Rawley put the hours in, became a fellow, rightfully. You know, it's not just nepotism. He was really worked very, very hard and was being built up to do this work for the next generation. And he died in the Great Plague. And that brings us on to who filled his boots at Corpus Christi. So the master during the Civil War Republic period was Dr. Love. John Spencer came along, was the great master of the college after this, um, because of course Raleigh Jr. couldn't do it. And his life's work was in Hebrew studies. Now this has a connection back to Parker, and there's a lot of emulation of Parker in this. This is life's work, this is the Hebrew rituals. Parker emulated in turn Martin Luther at the Reformation. He set up two chairs of Hebrew in each of the German universities that uh, were in the Protestant areas. Matthew Parker set up two chairs of Hebrew at Cambridge. Um, you've got John Spencer doing these studies and really there are a few big names in sort of Spencer studies. Um, and by the way, this is just me being silly, but I've written it with an S here because that's what's on his tomb in corpus, and I'm silly like that, but everywhere else it's written with a C. I'm just being bloody minded and writing while it's <laughs> what's on his gravestone in the college chapel. <laughs> but Spencer, whichever way you want to spell it. Um, with the Hebrew studies of people like Parker, obviously you're setting up the Church of England, John Spencer continues that in a particular direction, and his conclusion was about an idea of religious translation, the idea that there must have been a reason for the Jews being in Egypt and Moses and all of that, there must have been a reason for the exile in Babylon. That reason must be because they're hoovering up bits of semantic technology, bits of religious practice that will help to turn the religion gradually into something that's powerful towards making salvation for people. So it's God cooking. This is just God cooking through time, adding bits in. This was his big thesis. And really what that means is that there's this sense that at different points in time you do things according to who your audience is because they're effective. I do MacGuffins, I'm prattling on about. But you, you, you choose something that will move somebody through the narrative. It's the last step that they can take will be important and, uh, uh, and so forth. But he's taking these ideas about the changes in the New Testament versus the Old Testament, think about St. Paul. He's taking that, he's extrapolating it and starting to look back into Hebrew history because he wants to know what the Temple of Solomon looks like <laughs> or what rather it should look like in the present day because each time it's addressing a different audience. So you've got these ideas and this is what Spencer uh, writes. And it's quite funny because um, subsequent generations fell into two camps. One camp, this was hugely influential in the foundation of Freemasonry and it was widely received as being fantastic. Suddenly we can be enthusiastic about Egypt without a problem. It's very popular for that reason. Other people described it as being incredibly dangerous and you probably ought not read it. <laughs> but there we go, he was Dean of Ely, he was Master of Corpus, he was never accused of his ideas being heterodox in any way. This was a standard part of the way things were done in that period. Um, but it is interesting that this was taken in different ways. But you can see how it, you can see how within a Corpus Christi framework, rather than just seeing him as a scholar somewhere in Cambridge, connected with what Parker was doing, what does a Church of England look like, connected with what Roland Hill was doing, what does a Protestant building look like, there's actually a lot sort of popping and fizzing with all of this. So he's sort of one of the heirs of, of Raleigh. But the real, real heir of Raleigh didn't stick around at Corpus, he went on to even greater things. And that was Thomas Tennyson, who's the 
greatest Archbishop of Canterbury you've never heard of, and there's only one autobi—sorry, one biography of him, and that was written in 1948 with limited research materials. Incredibly under-researched man, considering that he went into corpus, he became a fellow. During the Great Plague, he was the only churchman who stayed in the city of Cambridge. The only one. He was the one who ministered to the sick and the dead during the Great Plague in Cambridge. That was him. And for that, he received a gift, a massive gift of silver plate in recognition of what he did by the townspeople, which is recorded in the vanishingly rare history of Corpus Christi, which spills all of the beans. Um, and this really, you know, he, he was really, really noticed for this. In particular, he was noticed by his friends, the Rawley family. He was a fellow, so you, you, you can see how these people were already a, a small, tight-knit group of people. But really, um, Rawley Sr. alighted on him because he just lost his son. This was when Rawley Jr. died. And this was the man who not only is a friend and a colleague, family friend, tight-knit group of people, but he was the one who actually comforted their son and actually buried him. As a result of which, Thomas Tennyson inherited all of Francis Bacon's papers and the task of publishing, which had yet to be completed. So that's Tennyson. He went on to be rector at St Martin in the Fields in London because he was noticed, probably because Rawley Senior was a royal chaplain and St Martin in the Fields, he was made a royal chaplain too. This is the church that serves Whitehall, <laughs> where we are now. Everything that was going on in Whitehall during the reign of Charles II and then James II and this man was at the forefront of the politics on the church side to do with the revolution of 1688. He's one of the men involved in that. So immediately, when William and Mary came over, incidentally coming over with Mary's chaplain being a corpus fellow, who became <laughs> a master of corpus later on, um, he was made um, Bishop of Lincoln. So Dean of Lincoln, Matthew Parker, Bishop of Lincoln, Thomas Tennyson. Can you see a pattern? They're emulating through time. His career is beginning to match. So he's now, Rawley Jr. is dead. This man is now being set up to be the next great generation of this rolling project. And then very shortly afterwards, when the sea was vacated, in the way it traditionally is, by death, um, he was able to finally ascend with all the warm, glowy blessings of William and Mary to being Archbishop of Canterbury. And he was the person who comforted Queen Mary on her deathbed. He went on to crown Queen Anne, who hated him, so he meddled in everyone else's business and stayed out of court. Um, and he was the regent. He actually ruled the country with two other people who masterminded the Protestant succession and George I coming over. So the dynasty that we now know, the Hanoverian succession. So this man's incredibly important. And let's have a look at their architecture, because this is supposed to be about buildings, uh, or rather their art. So in the history of the college, as I said, vanishingly rare, you learn all sorts of interesting details. And one of them caught my eye, which is that when Spencer died, his executor was Thomas Tennyson. He's got these chains of people. Who was his literary executor as well. So he now became the person for all of the various corpus books that needed processing. But in particular, he was a literary executor of this book and everything that he was doing, trying to marry together Hebrew scholarship of the day with what they were up to. Um, interestingly enough, in the same atmosphere, he also became the literary executor of Thomas Brown, the famous sort of mystic. So this man just hoovered up all of these different going concerns, all these different hopes, all sort of wrapped up together. Um, but he was told to create a piece of art, a piece of liturgical equipment, by uh, the will of Spencer. 
and that was a font which was put in at Ely, and it's no longer at Ely, it's actually at Christchurch, Oxford, and thank you very much to Christchurch Cathedral in Oxford for providing these photographs, because I couldn't get there and they were very obliging, so thank you to them. This is the curiously wrought font, when you've got somebody of the period saying, this thing is weird, we don't, <laughs> this thing is weird, just the area of weirdness. That inspires me to take some notice. So what have we got? We've got shells. The shells are, shells are sort of down here. You've got to think of them being the upside down pyramid in that octahedron, haven't you? And you've got these little winged heads which are sort of that baroque estimation of what a cherub might be and therefore you think cherubim, you think Ezekiel, you think of him talking about the coals, the red, and they're also sort of a square, tilted squarey shape. So actually you've got all of this hidden away in there. It looks really weird. Truly, they were correct. It's curiously wrought. Um, but there it is. So this was the font, and that was what Spencer uh, ordered and what Tennyson built. Oh, OK. Well, I'm going to overrun massively, but never mind. <laughs> um, so here's our little render, and I said we'd done a video to do with uh, Ezekiel's talk in more depth, but this is just a reminder what happens when you've got sort of red, red beams, tilted squares, and you've got white beams all coming together into the middle, just to sort of focus your thoughts, how the bottom of that, rather than looking at something like this, which to do with the top, the bottom of this is sort of like a bowl, um, and so a font, so where better to introduce someone to the church than something that is sort of bringing you along into the headspace of thinking about the idea of Ezekiel and you know, th these sort of ideas of concentrating these transformative spaces. So this is what Thomas Tennyson decided to do with the bequest of Bacon's papers. He published a book. The, um, this is a first edition here of this thing. So it's quite a small volume. Um, and there's one way of looking at it, of saying, OK, this is just the stuff that was left over and he just decided to make it available. Actually, it is edited. It is um, put together consciously in a very particular way to achieve certain ends. And um, the first half of it, really, is Tennyson going through explaining every single edition that's been published, all of the pirated editions and what they got wrong, presenting all of the receipts saying who talked to what publisher. So that's really how that sort of uh, comes together. And then we see bits and bobs in here of uh, what the politics were of Tennyson's own day. So here he's decided to put in a letter from the Queen of Bohemia. What's that about? Well, the Heidelberg connection. So I'll run through this quickly, because um, I am overrunning. Um, Matthew Parker founded two chairs of Hebrew. One of those was taken up by a corpus fellow called Emmanuel Cavalarius, who was trained at Heidelberg, so within that German uh, Reformation sort of uh, atmosphere. Later on, you've got Alexander Chapman becoming a fellow, um, and he's a contemporary of um, uh, Raleigh. He became the chaplain to Elizabeth Stuart, the daughter of King James, when she was married to Frederick V of the Palatinate in Germany. These were the folk who tried to take over the home, Holy Roman Empire for Protestantism, where they became the Winter King and Queen of Bohemia, Prague, after the death of Rudolf II. And they were chased out by the Habsburgs, and it all ended in tears, but they went into exile in, in the Netherlands and Amsterdam. Um, Thomas Tennyson, crowned George I, was to do with that. The claim to the throne of George I was through Elizabeth Stuart, because he was the grandson of Elizabeth and Frederick of the Palatinate. So you've got this interesting Heidelberg connection, whereas a corpus fellow who went out as the chaplain through all of that period and that great attempt on the Holy Roman Empire. And so all of that um, builds together. And so here you have a little nod by the man who was going to complete those dynastic ambitions towards the first part of that project when it was connected with the college. So it's very subtle, but once you know, you start to see what games he's playing. And also there are theological works of Lord Bacon, a very short bit, but one of them is uh, Bacon wrote a load of questions about religious war. He didn't write a treatise on it saying, this is what we think, this is it's the Socratic method. He said a load of questions. Do you really think this is a good idea? Do you really think this is a defensive war? He was great officer of state, advised to James I. What did James I do when everything was going wrong in Prague? 
he sent troops, but not to defend Bohemia. He sent troops to defend the Palatinate, the bit that they had a right to, and chose not to aggravate the Habsburgs. He chose this middle course of action. The Thirty Years' War still happened, and it was one of the most horrific conflicts. But the role of James I in it was to pursue a defensive policy rather than an aggressive policy. And he did so on the basis of these Socratic questions being asked by Bacon. So in the context of a man, Tennyson, who was going to be involved in the revolution of 1688 and who uh, was going to crown George I, to see that wrangling with these questions, really, this isn't so much of a cream tea adventure looking into the past of a much beloved national figure. This is actually a manifesto saying, we are skilled at not making the wrong call. So that's really what's going on with all of this. And... Um, during that period, he was heavily involved in Corpus. One of the things that he did is he demanded that the college copy out all of the documents of Parker's that were in manuscript and get them printed and sent up to Ely and deposited in places so all the foundational aspects of the Church of England might not be destroyed if James II turned the country into a Catholic country. So he was really active in all of these things. And then we get St Mary Abbot Church. This is another living of Corpus Christi. It was given to the college by Matthew Parker way back, but the Great Fire of London destroyed what there was and it was rebuilt. And this is what Wren designed. Christopher Wren designed this, which is nothing like that. Somebody said no. And I believe the men who said no were John Spencer, still alive at that point, Master of Corpus, because they were involved in a wrangle over mixing the parishes of Lawrence Pulteney and uh, St Mary Abbot Church, so the master was in constant communication. And he said to his friend Tennyson, he said, they're doing things with our church, make sure they do it right. And uh, Tennyson was somebody who knew Wren because they had worked together on a public library project in St Martin the Fields. So personal friends and John Evelyn helped with the design of that library, it no longer exists, another demolished building. Um, but the design profoundly changed, so what's going on with um, St Mary Abbot Church is a, is a great question. It's another bit of Thomas Tennyson meddling, paving the hall at Corpus with his own money when he was no longer there. He was in London, so we've got all of these links coming together. Um, let's have a look inside. So this is the dome. If we're talking about the earlier period, the 1680s part of it, you can see how this is one of these. There's a pyramidal roof. The church itself is 55 feet by 55 feet, a number that we know quite well now. So he's referencing Sultan, perhaps referencing Matthew Parker being saved at Sultan. 55 feet by 55 feet is a choice. The dome inside was painted a little bit later, after the death of Spencer. So this is definitively when Tennyson was Archbishop, being powerful, getting into all this stuff because he wasn't popular at court, and so he's meddling in things. And so this is likely at least consulting him. And you can see you have shells. Sorry, the image is a bit dark. You can have shells. And these here have the cherubs. Remember that font. So let's rattle through. Here's the font. Shells, cherubs. Let's mark these up. So the cherubs, we've got those tilted squares, and here we've got those hexagons. You can see what's going on. We've got God the Father above. It's the Hebrew name of God. Tetragrammaton. Vertical dimension. You've got two horizontal dimensions coming along. In 3D space, this is conjuring this idea of the rhombic dodecahedron inside this, this brick cube, like Sultan, 55 feet. And uh, that's just marking up the font to make it uh, extra explicit for you. And the idea that these red beams might be connected with England, I said before about St Andrew and about the saltire, well, it's interesting that everywhere in London, where the arms of London use the flag of the resurrection in the way that England does, the way that Genoa does, so on, for some reason, there's always this tilted square aspect to the way the heraldry is put together. It's almost like they know, isn't it? Boom. That's what happens if you fill in the gaps. It's a little game. Think about the date of that dome, 1708. What happened the year before in 1707? The Act of Union. So you have a patriotic gesture, and you also have a way of looking at the way the country was being cohered. But of course it wasn't fully being cohered because there were still these religious tensions. Let's look at what happened to Sultan during this period. It lost its roof at some point. But they put some lamps on the corners, some flaming urns. So you've got 
now on the points of a cube, and that's where the lamps need to be to shine in the right angle. It's where they have to burn down to the right level. Points of the cube, you've got these. And this is a monument that was put up to Rowland Hill. Giant, socking great big column. It's reminiscent, isn't it, of uh, those printed documents, that, that language. They called it an observatory, so there's something there about something there about light as well and the passions of that age. People in the know, people in the centre of this heraldic, emblematic, MacGuffin world. John Vanbrugh, his very last building. He had an extraordinary career. He went off to India in the East India Company, came back, was a spy, got locked up in the Bastille, got let out on a prisoner exchange, was a playwright, did scene dressing. That's how he got into architecture. And at some point in his architectural career, he was building such big houses like Blenheim, Castle Howard, they decided to make him a herald. He never really did any work, and they all hated him for it in the College of Arms because he never really showed up. But he was a herald, and he learnt something. And his last building, the cubic building, was flaming urns around a dome. Moreover, on the inside of it, and unfortunately I don't have a photograph because they're sort of closely guarded, and they don't let anybody in there, but there's a Cosmati pavement replica. There's a Cosmati Cosmates pavement in that building with all of this geometry in it. So his swan song, the last building he built, he never saw it completed in his lifetime. That's what he was doing. And then we get another one. And this is where it gets really interesting. Because the family who took over Lulworth were recusants. They were Catholic and they held on strongly to that faith. And when we reach, I said it was from Henry III to George III, when we reach that end point in today's lecture, they built a chapel. And they went to George III and said, I'd like to build a Catholic chapel. And this was the first Roman Catholic freestanding chapel since the Reformation. And it was illegal to do. Broke the law. But because George III said, you may build a, mausole you may build a mausoleum and what you do within it is your own business. He sort of said, well, I can't break the law because of, you know, Bill of Rights, all of that, you know, parliamentary sovereignty. But, you know, royal assent, tacitly. They built it. You can see where this is going. Well, first of all, it looks a little bit like um, a certain Verulam house, doesn't it? With its, with its bows and its corners. Flaming urns. And there you are, and here's the, uh, here's the information about the dates of this building. The man it was built for, Thomas Well, absolutely instrumental in the campaign for Catholic emancipation. So you've got to remember this is a time when universities wouldn't admit you unless you were part of the Church of England. You couldn't be an officer of state. And Thomas Weld helped to change that. He built this before the law was changed to allow this to happen. George the First, uh, sorry, George the Third, actually visited it, saw it as a chapel, didn't raise any objections. Think about how the late Queen was about talking about her opinions. But his royal visit paved the way for Catholic emancipation. Here's a recap, just to show how all of these things tie together, because I really have rattled through it. It's quite a complicated journey. Hexagons in four corners of a square, Cosmati pavement, Bodium, Lulworth, and Rupera. All of these examples, these are just the ones that I've chosen to highlight. Lamps in four corners of a square, we have Sultan in the later phase. Temple of the Four Winds, St. Mary Lulworth, that supremely important building. And uh, square pyramidal roof, we have Sultan Hall, Bachy Greig, Verulam, and St. Mary Abchurch. So all of these things come together. And it's a non trivial set in the way that those Almondale manuscripts are a non trivial set. And with the two of them together, that might be quite a frightening prospect except for the way that we can actually trace this all the way back into Anglo-Saxon history and after that Henry III, there is actually a line all the way through which shows how this is bound up with really mainstream theology and also the philosophy that they were engaged in. So, an epilogue. I'm hoping soon um, I'll be able to do a lecture at um, Braxted Park in Essex. This is a slightly different path through these mysteries, um, but the really interesting thing is that Great Braxted is one of the livings of Corpus, and there's a write-up about it in here. The fellows are very, very proud of that connection. And it appears to have been under their influence. There's an extraordinary garden building that was produced, uh, which you can have a little taster 
picture of there and being in the 19th century and seeing these things work, what were the products of this? Well, the man who owned the estate at Brexted was in the East India Company in the Bank of England. And let's just, uh, as a little spoiler, say the direction that this went in, which is that several of the fellows of Corpus Christi ended up being very big in the Anglican Church in India. So you can see that Corpus Christi has really been a huge number of things. This is a different direction to spiral that off, so that's just a little taste of something extra. But that is a wrap, and thank you very much for listening. <laughs>